So thank you very much. So it's not always not very easy to uh, have the uh, closing remark session because everyone is a little bit tired and has been a, a very long day. But I must say, uh, to me at least, uh, I think, and uh, probably I, I would say to you as well, I think it was a very, very interesting day. And I think we learned a lot about uh, cross-border healthcare, about the needs, about the mobility of healthcare professionals, uh, of particularly, of course, uh, e-health and, and other issues. Uh, so there is a new wave coming up. And uh, I must say I'm also a true believer in, Euro in Europe. I think that is uh, very important because I was trained in the United States and visit this country very often. Uh, I have recently been uh, to, uh, to China. And I think uh, un unless uh, we get all the European efforts together, I think it will not be a we will not be able to compete with uh, these uh, huge countries because, of course, they all uh, are very innovative. They have very bright people. They work hard. And uh, I think in, in, for the individual European countries, it will not be possible. So I think the European idea is, uh, even though it has been heavily criticized by, by some, I think is uh, as lively and as vivid as, as ever. I think that is, uh, and that was also uh, nicely shown. And uh, maybe I can open up uh, one of the, because uh, our as highly esteemed the panelists already made their closing remarks with regard to, the, to this uh, uh, um, cross-border initiative. Uh, but uh, the, the question that we had over dinner uh, last, uh, last night was, should there be eventually one big health market in Europe? So is it, does it really make sense uh, uh, eventually to have uh, such a fragmented system, which even in the various member countries is, is quite fragmented? Wouldn't it, in the long run, I mean, probably will not reach this within the next uh, few years, but in the long run, to have one big single market where it is just a natural thing that a patient from Lithuania goes to Denmark for treatment and so on, and no one will ask any questions anymore. Would that be desirable or is this completely science fiction? What would be your opinion? Maybe we'll start with the uh, okay, to yeah. the very left hand side. Yeah. <laughs> so that gives yeah, uh, Karen Karen but some some some, idea, some some minutes to, to think about it. <laughs> right. I'm happy to pick that up because it was a question not quite framed the same way that I'd asked myself in the course of the presentation this morning. I'd, in preparing for today, I'd actually put together a couple of uh, slides worth eight or nine points, which I'm so glad aren't showing behind me, because as a result of the discussions today, almost all of what I thought coming into the, into the day has, has been firmly parked. But one of the points that was raised for me today when we were listening to the um, ex Matthias's excellent talk this morning about what happens if you have a free market and you allow the economy effectively to determine where people go, is that you have a very powerful engine, but you don't seem to have the brakes. You, know, you don't have control over the brakes. And I think it's a nice idea that there could be a free market, but I think we, we almost need to be careful what we wish for. Uh, maybe not so much free, but single market, more or less. So that's maybe a difference, yeah. Yeah, OK, okay maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but the idea that patients would think nothing of moving to where there might be the most excellent center, or that health professionals would move where it effectively suits their purposes, and certainly that's what we've um, seen or heard this morning, was that people move to where the jobs are, where the money are, where the money is, where the prospects are, not necessarily in response to patient need, which was the, the single biggest alarm bell for me. Um, so I, I, I'd, I'd come back and say I, I, I would not necessarily rush to wish for what you're describing now. I no, no, I, I was just asking, but, uh, yeah, because yeah. it's, it's uh, not easy. It's not an easy answer, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, I can follow that, and I'm very happy that I do not have to talk against you, uh, because <laughs> I, I think uh, it's not it's not just a question of of our treaty that health and uh, the organization of health and the organization of the social welfare and social system is still um, duty of the member states and and the, and the responsibility and the competence of the member states. So uh, and. For for the for the time being, it uh, it makes sense because when uh, I'm from a one of the smallest member states uh, from Austria, 
And we still have a federal system, health system. So we have nine lenders, and every land has its own health organization, and it's not always smart, I know that, but that's how it works. And that's, just, that's true with whole of Europe. So the systems are very different. Uh, the financing is very different. It's sometimes it's tax paid, sometimes it's insurance paid. So I think we have to go this long, long way until we do have uh, at least harmonization in some parts where we do have mm -hmm. common standards, where we do have uh, common uh, access, a guaranteed common access. So I think in the far, far future, it might be a possibility not to have uh, the, the single, uh, the, 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 um, the free market, but, but the, because I think health should never be uh, a Ball, game ball for, for the free market. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, yep. I, I do, not, do not even want to visualize what's happening <laughs> then. Uh, so I, I do think it, it's still something where uh, not only politics, but democracies are responsible for the health systems. And I think that's something Europe has still to work on uh, because I think the parliament is very democratic. It's very, uh, it's very um, uh, transparent. Council is not always. So I do think as long as we do not know how these decisions uh, come together, who, who, who is responsible, I think that as long as that is not clear, we, we cannot have a, a common, single, free health and care market. Okay, so that answers our dinner discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> and other questions to the panelists and uh, in general, because we are excellent in time. So... Any questions? Last, yes, yes, please. Thank you, sir. My name is Paul Stunik. I'm from Austria, from the Medical University, and also part of the Emerging EULA network. And it's it's part of the e-health thing. And it, today it was discussed about the opportunities of um, harmonization of data sets and um, well, trying to see the standards of care and. Uh, implementing quality indicators which can then be compared across Europe. Um, this is a very nice idea and I'm, I'm full in favor of uh, harmonizing data sets to, to use them also for research. Um, the thing is, who is then in charge of, of doing that extra administrative work? It's the first thing and who is paying for the whole um, global data set to yeah, I th yeah. Any any comments or uh, yeah? I, yeah. I, I need to say I, it's a question of scale, isn't it? So there there are areas where there are initi initiatives just like that. So if you look at rare conditions like scleroderma, for instance, the U-Star network in conjunction with uh, Usenet, we we're looking at a common data set. So validating instruments across a variety of languages, for instance, to allow data to be pulled from a number of different. Uh, countries and centres, and at the moment, USTAR and EULA are paying for it, but that's on a tiny scale. So it's, it's, it's one condition um, where the, the strength is in bringing in those small centres together. How you scale it up um, is a different matter, and where the money comes from from that is where I look to my right. Want to comment or? Uh, <laughs> there, there always are some projects that can yeah. be financed. So from Horizon 2020 or uh, yeah. No, but I, I do think we have. Uh, it's I, I do not think that we get a harmonized data system in in the, in the near future. But what we do, th what I do think, what we need is is harmonized um, um, benchmarks. Harmonized. Uh, how, how do you call it? So, so that the data we get is is really comparable because the problem we do have right now, uh, we are, we collect a lot of data, uh, what, uh, from from the hospitals, from incidents, from everything. But the data is very often not comparable. So you have a lot of numbers, but actually they're not telling a story. Yep. I, I think that's that's a very good statement because uh, I think it will be inevitable that we do this. I mean, uh, we have in, at the Charity University just hired uh, Böttinger, who just came from Mount Sinai in, in, in New York. And uh, apparently they have uh, not millions, but billions to gather all these data. And so every, every patient is actually entered into the program, then a blood is stored and uh, will be reanalyzed in, at Mount Sinai, for instance, but also in other uh, big uh, American universities. So uh, if 
anything comes out of it which will lead to immediate care of the patient, so better candidate genes, better treatment, we'll, we'll have to find. But, uh, of course, uh, it is, is, is extremely interesting to, to gather all these data, to have excellent phenotypes, and to motivate the physicians actually to enter this uh, each time a patient is admitted, and uh, also to convince the patient, which normally is not, not such a problem, that this is a good thing and that they should allow that their pseudonymized uh, data are actually analyzed. Uh, the, the refusal quote by the patients in, in Mount Sinai is less than 20%. So most of the patients agree that this is a good thing. I think, uh, and um, in, in Europe, of course, we need to harmonize data protection laws. I think that is very important because we want to send data from Austria to uh, Denmark, for instance, uh, to compare uh, various uh, patient uh, phenotypes, uh, genetic backgrounds, environmental uh, uh, issues. So I think that is, a, that is something which is also cross-border and, and a, a very, very important uh, European issue. Other questions? Doesn't seem to be the case. So uh, um, Karen and uh, Tony, you want to make any uh, final remarks and Final closing remarks, what you think is, is particularly important for the uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen to take home? Uh, yeah, well, I guess mm -hmm. my, my first and, and probably really closing comment is that we spent a bit of time this afternoon in workshops talking about the challenges that face us. And I was sitting there conscious that I must be an overly optimistic person because I was actually looking at some of the challenges we were being asked to articulate. And I was thinking, I see plenty of opportunities out there. So we have challenges that can be viewed from both ways. So we have an ever-increasing uh, cost of providing healthcare, which means we cannot keep doing things the same way. And so there's an opportunity there that because the system must change, we can put ourselves in a good place to be ready to adapt to the change and to do things that will be best for our community while the other communities are trying to sort themselves out. Uh, similarly, with the ageing population, I think we're all aware of the demographic time bomb. And again, it's a pressure for the EU. It's a pressure for our community up to a point, but it's a tremendous opportunity. We are in a position where we are providing care and therefore have some influence in an area where people have increasing polymorbidity, so multiple conditions, where mobility is ever more important to them, where we have a genuine role to play. So in the context of health professionals uh, on the EU radar, I think we're in a very strong position, and I think we should be ready, willing, and able to leverage that position to our own advantage within the EU Commission. Thank you very much, Tony. And yeah. <coughs> Karen Karma. Just a few, I think, three points. Uh, first of all, it's because I do think whatever uh, we talk, it's it's prevention and it's it's health literacy, and we have to take some money for prevention. Uh, early diagnosis, timely access to treatment, and yeah, I, th I, I like the, se the sentence I uh, used, reimbursement systems to encourage appropriate care. That's something I take from here, and I do think that's very important. <laughs>